My name is Brian Wish. I'm an entrepreneur, CEO, and Pathfinder. If I've learned anything in life, it's that self-discovery is a critical part of living intentionally, building meaningful relationships, and achieving the future we see for ourselves. In July of 2021, I sold all my possessions, headed west, and began a quest to live a fuller and more meaningful life. The experience helped me truly understand the power of a single moment. And through my conversations with leaders from all walks of life, I've seen how that one phone call, heartbreak, diagnosis, or lost job can transform the entire course of our lives. In this podcast, I sit down with entrepreneurs, influencers, and experts across industries to talk through the events that changed everything. Together, we'll relive the make or break decisions, hard conversations, periods of despair and hope, chance encounters, and everything that followed. Daniel James is the founder and CEO of Flight Performance, formerly known as Mint Performance. Flight Performance is built to accelerate growth for disruptive brands through social-first brand performance marketing. Before founding Flight Performance, Daniel held positions at multiple pioneering tech startups that helped transform the internet into what it is today, including MySpace and AOL. Daniel is also an angel investor in multiple startups, including Spudsy, Caliwater, Avi, and Goodsport. Originally from the UK, Daniel moved his family to the United States a decade ago and fell into the world of startups and entrepreneurship. Find out how this move changed his life on The One Away Show. Daniel, welcome to The One Away Show. Hey, Brian. Happy to be here. Good to be chatting. Happy to have you here. Um, so Daniel, uh, and you shared a bit about you on the first call we have, which I thought was quite inspiring. But uh, what is the one away moment that you want to share with us today? Yeah, I've been giving this some thought because the, there's there's multiple, right? But I think the the one moment was moving to the US. So I I moved to America from England ten years ago um, with my family. My daughter was three at the time. Um, and I think that changed my life and the trajectory of my life in such a meaningful way. Um, I would definitely say that's, that's the, that's the moment. And we'll give us some context here. So what made you move to the U S and, uh, you know, what made you all the way to the West coast from uh, Los Angeles? I mean, from, from the UK. So it's funny. I mean, <laughs> the journey of life right prior decisions set you up for future uh movements and stuff but i first came to la when i was with myspace when i joined myspace in 2004 which was another pivotal moment for me because up until that point i was a, a music college and um in a band and had just kind of bit part jobs and that was my first introduction to a proper job and also marketing and um, I came over to LA with them to really learn all about digital and social marketing. And, you know, I think as a young 21 year old coming to Los Angeles with the MySpace crew, which was a very fun crew at the time, um, I just I just fell in love with I fell in love with the vibe, with the city, with the weather, with the food, with the people, and also just the overwhelming sense of opportunity that was around me definitely sparked by the creative entrepreneurial thinkers of my space but just just in general i just absolutely loved the 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 feel of the city and made it my mission from that point to one day move to la and run my own company that's awesome that uh, you you took the the leap uh in the early days of social and those were those were the days of, uh, they were the days yeah. they definitely were <laughs> Were you, I mean, just curious when you, when you, were you scared? Were you excited? I mean, what, like what was going through your head about kind of making this sleep? You know, I'm the sort of person who I dive into things uh, with both feet and think later <laughs> sometimes. So it didn't feel, I'd wanted to do it for so long and there was such a sense of excitement, right? Uh, because, you know, there was, 
10 plus years, but no, nearly 15 years or something between first wanting to move here and actually moving here. So at the time, I can't say that there was any sense of nerves, you know, um, leaving all your friends and family behind. Other than people I worked with, I knew no one in the, the US um, whatsoever. So, but I can't say I was nervous. I was, I was or scared. I was just full of excitement. And, mm. and I think like that, that's why that's one of the reasons why it really changed because I felt like this is going to be something I can use as a catalyst to do more and uh, more things that I wanted to do that for some reason, I didn't feel like I had the opportunity to do as much of that living in the UK. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd love to know, you know, it seems like you were quite ambitious as well. You, you followed this excitement, uh, this opportunity with MySpace, uh, get your feet wet, uh, the early days of social. You know, you talked about putting two feet in and going fully in and then thinking later. What what was going two feet in? What did that look like when you arrived in LA? You know, I think it's, it's partly also my um, highly addictive personality of if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to try and be the absolute best at it. And I become very narrowly focused on, on those things. Uh, for me, it was what an incredible thing. I've been given this opportunity to move to somewhere that I've always wanted to live. And it's not an easy thing. Um, I would say a large, large portion of people who live in England would want to move to another country or America. In England's a phenomenally cool place, but um, there is a, you know, there's a lot of people that would probably want to do the same thing as I was given the opportunity to. So I've, I felt like um, given that opportunity, it was up to me to grasp that with, with both hands and maximize it, right? So I was currently working for my past company. I felt like I had to repay them back by being the absolute best they had given me this opportunity to move over to the US. And yes, it was because I was good at what I did. Um, but I was like, I need to repay that by going 10x above, mm. you know, my capabilities. Like, how can I be the absolute best for this company? Because they have given me this massive life-changing opportunity. So I was just incredibly focused on being the best I could be. I have and had a pretty tireless work ethic. So for me, it really just involves taking every opportunity I was given, working so hard, sometimes not smart, but definitely hard um, to kind of repay the faith that had been given in me and the opportunity. And that kind of expanded over the years of living here into, you know, my aspirations of what was possible became bigger. So that's where I started my own company and um, grew that and had a and, and, and ended up getting acquired and, and everything else. So for me, it was really kind of a, another day one. Okay, oh, I've got a life now in the US. I had to build it. I had to build it to a point where I can stay here. So my family has security and everything else. So yeah, it was really just initially, though, that sense of paying back the trust and faith and the opportunity I was given. That's special. I mean, it's like uh, the grit and the uh, just n willingness to do whatever it took to uh, make U.S. home. You, you did. One of the things about the U.K., you know, it's interesting. Did you feel limited there? Like, did you feel uh, as if there was just it sounds like there was something you just always felt there was something more for you that was beyond there? I mean, I'm just curious about, you know, you're talking about most people who live there wish they could live somewhere else. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. And, and again, I need to be careful, but England's a phenomenal place. What I, and it's probably like the circles I was in or, or whatever. And again, I was surrounded by amazing people. It's just, you know, I hate to maybe coin a cheesy phrase, but America is the land of opportunity. I will say that England, when I go back now and we have, you know, um, our, our company head office is back there. And I think there's a much uh, from an entrepreneurial and especially the world I operate in entrepreneurial marketing I think it's really come on right there's a lot of new businesses and, and cool stuff happening back then that wasn't so much the case and so for me it really is like that land of opportunity and, and there's there's basic things Brian <laughs> I don't think people realize and and 
don't get me wrong, there's the spectrums of Los Angeles, right? And any city. Um, it's not like everything is perfect here, but you're very lucky if you grow up in this type of environment, just basic things like the weather, right? Like um the access to things, the the I think, yes, England felt to me quite claustrophobic. And you mentioned that phrase of like always wanting to do bigger and better. It's something my mum has always said about me. Um, I grew up in this tiny little village in the north of England where mm. everybody knew everybody. Like there was, I don't know, a couple of hundred people in the entire place. I think going from that to then moving down to London and then coming over to LA, it's like, for me, it's always been that stepping stone of bigger and more opportunity. And I guess I've always seeked that out. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it seems like your mom saw something in you early as well. And um, you trusted that voice to uh, do something bigger yeah. with it. So, you know, you mentioned uh, when you got here, you were with MySpace and you went and started your own company and got acquired. Um, what was that, you know, first entrepreneurial or first official entrepreneurial tour of duty in the U.S.? What uh, what did you do? Yeah, so um, it's funny because I don't really have that traditional lemonade stand at the age of three entrepreneurial story at all um because I worked for amazing companies that were very entrepreneurial in their nature uh, myspace AOL turn for me the kicking off point of starting my entrepreneurial journey and launching my own agency um was the company I was with I was head of strategy uh working on digital and social marketing for Toyota Red Bull craft disney adidas there was lots of brands that i touched um and you know i've i felt like as i progressed in my career and did well and became more senior i was moving away from what i actually enjoyed which was the strategy the brand marketing the performance marketing it was it became about contracts and kickbacks and all this shit and it just felt like not as exciting um and you know when it's like devise a strategy but really we just need to spend the money um so that we get it in our budget next year and then living in LA I met a lot of people who run who ran their own companies who ran brands who were founders um and there was just a big opportunity for me to work with them and actually have a massive impact on their business versus working with these huge behemoths where you know, it, you, can, you can't move the needle as much, right? So that was the real tipping off point as to starting my own company, um, which was about four years ago. I actually worked for my agent, for my last company for a year whilst building my agency on the side um, during like lunch breaks and evenings and weekends and stuff. So I built, I built my own agency to six figures and we had about 10 full-time people before I actually joined full-time. And the goal then honestly was, I just need to be able to pay myself the same salary, uh, build it to that point, you know, I have obligations and stuff like that. Um, and that happened pretty quickly within, within a year. So I was able to join full-time. That's pretty amazing that you got a six figure agency off the ground while you were working full time and uh, were employing others and uh, all the pieces. Uh, so congratulations on that. I'm going to take a side step and then we can come back to the work. But Dan, one, one of the things that strikes me about you, and I think on the first conversation stood out is the way you speak and carry yourself just from across the screen. It's rather humble. Like it, it's um, you just seem to have this very kind of humble nature to you. Have you, have you thought about that before? Have you, do you first agree with that? And if so, you know, what, what do you think is at the root there? You know, you're not the first person to, you're not the first person to say that to me. I feel incredibly grateful for so much opportunity that I've been given in life and in business and the people I get to work with and the faith that's shown in me. I find it quite difficult to uh, applaud myself for what I've achieved, because I still feel like I've got so far to go. It's, you know, and I think, I just think it's in my nature to be like that. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> it's like, it's actually funny, because one of the things I've been doing more of is, is, you know, trying to build my personal brand a bit more from the standpoint of, I've 
achieved quite a lot um, and I have a lot of knowledge to share. Um, but I do find it sometimes difficult to uh, talk about things because if it ever comes across as self-congratulatory, I, yeah. I don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Even saying to you, I built a, you know, six figure. I was like, oh, uh, you know, it's a little bit. It's, it's like this balance between like owning your value and talking about what you've done and in a way that it's like guiding other people versus look at me. Right. Yeah. I think and say the same thing. It can come across two different ways, but uh, yeah. Anyway, it's something I know this about uh, just the way you come through. Um, so yeah, you were talking about building this business. I mean, did, did you see building a business in the United States as the kind of the ticket to kind of cement yourself here and have the freedom on your terms that you wanted or or was the plan just you didn't know exactly like you, you were going to ride it out, you know, with different companies? I mean, what how were you thinking about things, uh, for, you know, before you started the company? Even back in my space days, 2004 years ago, before I started my own company, I had the overall vision of one day running my own company and living in living in L.A. I didn't really think about it much after that point. I was I was doing really cool work with really cool people at the companies I was with. Um, but then when I moved to LA and, and like I said, when I started to become a little bit disillusioned with the work I was doing and the company I was with, not that the company was bad, great company, great people, but just I'd kind of been there, done it for so long. It was more, I have enough faith in my own capabilities and drive and skill sets that I can do this for myself. And there was a couple of other things that happened at that time. Um, my partner at the time, she was she was made redundant and she also worked in social media and influencer marketing. And it's like, well, fuck it, don't go and get another job. Why don't we why don't we just do it ourselves? Why don't we just find brands, do like start doing this ourselves? And so there was a couple of little moments like that that were the catalyst. Um, also me getting my green card. So I had the I had the comfort of I didn't have to be tied to the company I was with I think for me as well I've only really worked at like three four companies in my entire career before starting my own um I, I chose well I love the company I was working for so I probably would have stayed there if a couple of those things hadn't happened that really pushed me to to start my own company but you know it happened quite quickly there was an opportunity to to do it i knew a couple of the right people we had a couple of clients within the first week of me having conversations um and then we started to perform for them and then they started to say oh my other friend runs a brand could you have a chat with them it happened very organically where i was like wow there's actually a real opportunity here i can't say i had the aspiration at that time to go and build a 50 person agency and get acquired and build global teams and do all of this. It was more like, I'm really enjoying this. I'm just going with the flow because it seems to be scaling. And I kind of figured everything out as we went along. Yeah, no, that's, um, I mean, again, like you, you trusted the instinct and you're like, what, how do I take this, these skill sets, right? It seemed like you, you MySpace gave you a lot of gifts or, or they get a lot of knowledge on how to do things. And you were able to, Take what you liked and the partner at the time and, and really go apply it to, to what was what was next um you know i'm curious you're, you're in the you know in the performance marketing space that was your you're still doing performance marketing for my right but the first the first company also did performance marketing so we started off um it was more so it was performance marketing it was paid paid social and influencers is gotcha. what we started with uh, yeah. for e-commerce brands and and that's still what we do we've, we've added service and capabilities we've evolved quite quite a lot but that was yeah that was always what we're doing because prior oh, so to it's that still, it's still the same business today correct yeah oh okay got yeah. it i thought you said um a few the first business that got acquired or something oh uh, we oh we got acquired about a month ago um so but it's the same it's the same business Oh, okay. I, I missed. Okay. I got it. I thought it happened early on. It was something else. Got oh, no. Sorry. Well, first, congratulations. Um, Thank you. So, I mean, uh, with, with the intersection of influencers and brands and e commerce, like, what was the interest there? I mean, obviously, you know, good money and, and a way to build a business, but 
you know, you, you pick the path off, you know, something you're clearly learning about, but, but why that space at that time? What did you see? I mean, you were early in this space. But we'd been doing that since 2004. We did influencer marketing, but there was influencer marketing happening on MySpace in 2004, 2005. It was just called partnerships. You would find a brand, find a person, bring them together, market it for the purpose of driving some form of outcome and sale. Um, so it's always been something and that that has that I've been working with, working on, aware of. Um, but at that time, when Mint now flight performance, I started my own agency, you know, Instagram still had organic reach. Facebook ads wasn't tapped out um, in terms of, you know, real arbitrage and and performance. And I also felt like a lot of these brands were not leveraging these tools to the full capabilities. And just there was a lack of knowledge and insight. And a lot of agencies um, maybe who I felt didn't have the experience that I had of how to do this strategically and and as well as maybe we could, right? Everyone thinks that. There's great agencies out there, don't get me wrong, but I just saw a, a gap and an opportunity. Um, and very early on, felt like influencers into paid was not being leveraged enough as it should. Influencers and kind of were, uh, were and even more so now, are the, are the bedrock of these platforms, right? Um, and so we were out the gates. I mean, whitelisting Spark has become super popular now. We 100% went in our, our entire kind of paid strategy early on was put more influencers, more people representing the brand, showcasing the brand, talking about it, giving social proof into paid and use that to scale your paid results. Um, a lot of the ads back then that I used to see was just static product shots and, and stuff like this. And we kind of you know, this was four or five years ago, it was very influencer paid driven. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I, I love what you said. It's like, you know, the way paid was being done, you know, the way you saw it, one, there was strategy, which you're clearly good at, but uh, how do we use people to drive product and, and, and create, you know, drive brands and, and people are brands. And so, um, it's it's 2004 was early uh and you clearly yeah we're ahead of that for sure so super cool because you hear about influencer marketing companies all the time you know uh and you don't realize really the origin uh and you were at the origin social media and the, the we found the origin way of uh the influencer marketing side of it you know i'm curious Dan, so you've been running almost 20 years 19 years uh since you started um over this 19 year journey, you know, from start to acquisition, how, how do you think you changed the most as a leader, you know, from an evolution perspective at a human level, you know, who were, who was Daniel when you first started to versus who's Daniel today? I was, I was carefree and happy. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> there's probably some truth there. I mean, we're probably carefree. No, there's definitely some truth there. You know, I think, that's a that's a really good question. Um, listen, anyone who has built a business or started something from scratch, I don't care what anyone says, regardless of the successes you achieve, it's incredibly difficult. Um, uh, from a pure work perspective, right? Do the right things that drive the right result. But from a from a mental perspective, it's f for me and maybe there's people who are more able to just take everything in their stride, um, you know, it, it's challenging. Um, you sacrifice a lot, or at least I did, especially when I was working full time at my last company and building this agency on the side, like there was no, there was no free time. My mind was consumed with it. And again, it's a bit my personality. Um, if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to do it to be the best I can possibly be. Um, and I'm very driven around that. I think how have I changed? Um, you know, I think the rate, the rate you have to adapt when you're the CEO of a growing agency, you can't learn the things you're going to come up against. People can tell you until you've gone through it, you don't know how you're going to react. You don't know the right situations. And also there's no blueprint to being a CEO, right? There's books you can read, 
you just have to learn and adapt. And you have to learn and adapt ahead of your company's growth curve, because you have to be driving that growth curve. And then you have to adapt and keep up to the demands that business then puts on you as you achieve that growth curve. So I think I've had to adapt very quickly um, to situations I'd never faced before. And, and I think it's provided me a significant amount of additional resilience mm -hmm. as a person. And I think that's been one of the biggest changes. You know, I think the the level of sheer effort and mental and work resilience you have to like learn and become habit to build a business um is challenging but ultimately rewarding yeah absolutely i mean i think there's no greater teacher in life than building a business and uh yeah you have to grow with it for sure or it'll it'll consume you in unhealthy ways so um you i'd love to know you know you talked about the adaptability you talked about having to change and you know, you're met with situations that you don't you have no idea how to respond to. Do, do does anything stand out to you over the last 20 years? One, one or two of those situations that you'll never forget? It's been about 10 this week, Brian. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about like the holy, you know, what moments, you know, we may not make it tomorrow or the, you know. Oh, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, a uh, uh, 100% that has. I mean, um Probably, probably stuff I've not even shared publicly before. I, you know, there was a moment very early on at Mint um, when we started the agency and we, we, were a, we were a smaller team and we had someone running our, our paid social business. And, and, you know, that person left very abruptly. And so overnight, we had nobody to service our clients on paid. Um, and it's like, you just have to step in and figure it out. So I stepped in, ran the paid, looked to try and hire someone. Um, you know, the, the, that doesn't feel like an existential thing in one way, but it did at the time. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely yeah. did at the time. Um, and I'd say there's been a couple of moments of that, you know, the, 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 the friction points of scaling a business bootstrapped, right? Cash flow. You have to manage that when you're trying to grow and that gets squeezed and, you know, working for other companies and not being a P&L whole like owner plus management of the actual bank account. You see the reports, but you're not the one having to fix it <laughs> when it's all on you. Um, you know, and I think I think there's, there's, there's been many moments where it felt like, you know, COVID when COVID hit, I, we had it turned out to be a big boom for e-commerce, but it, you know, we had no idea. Like, yeah. are we going to be shut down tomorrow? Is this business going to end tomorrow? If the mm -hmm. world shuts down, what do we do? How do we protect ourselves against that? So um, there's been a few and I'm sure there'll be more. Always, always will be. Can't, can't avoid them. Uh, no, thanks for the context. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's great to hear others' journeys and, uh, we all go through the crazy nights, but uh, just got to keep marching, you know. You know, Daniel, you've clearly grown as a leader. You've built a team, sold, you know, you came to the States. I mean, you've done a lot of things I think a lot of people would dream of uh, doing. Um, you know, I'm sure you're, you'll still be working at the company for a year, a couple, few years, but uh, right now, like in this moment, like since you sold, you know, do you feel like you have pressure off you? Do you do, what's it What's it feel like to kind of look back on these twenty years and does it feel like a new chapter? I'm just I'm just curious, kind of where you're at with everything. It's funny that I'll if I'll tell you the acquisition story. So I sold I sold Mint to Flight Story, which is owned by Stephen Bartlett um, and Oliver Yonchev, um, who had previously founded and sold social chain agency. Um, you know, hugely successful entrepreneurs, super smart guys when it comes to building companies and marketing, like on, honestly, best in the, some of the best in the world to ever do it. Um, and when I started Mint, uh, my agency, 
it was social chain that I looked up to was we do different work, but wow, look at the way they represent themselves in the world. Look at the way they market their agency, their teams, their culture, their philosophies to marketing. I was like, that I held social chain as a standard of what I ultimately wanted to get my own agency to. Mm. And then for it to come full circle, they exited social chain and started an, an, a new company called Flight Story about two years ago. Um, so for it to come full circle and now be partnered with the team who founded the agency, I essentially wanted to aspire to become mm. um, is kind of uh, crazy to think through. And the reason for selling was, you know, I'd scaled and built Mint and and I, I kind of use the analogy of like, ah. Oh, our mini rocket ship being attached to their bigger rocket ship. Mm -hmm. We're both growing and just the opportunity to partner with such smart entrepreneurs and operators and the agency that they've built. Um, for me, it's day one, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like, well, all this stuff got us here. We, we remain, we, we have a philosophy and an ethos for who and what we are and why we exist in the world. Um, and Oliver said this to me actually is, what it's done is it's um, broadened my horizons of what I think is possible as a collective, as a collective agency now, and as a collective group of entrepreneurs running this company, what we can achieve collectively is my mind keeps going bigger and bigger. The, the, whereas at Mint, like I think early stages, well, just earn the salary I was earning, right? Get to 10 people, get to 15. Now I'm thinking, there's no fucking limit on what we can achieve if we do the right things day in, day out. What do you see now that you couldn't see before with the right partner? I mean, it seems like it's opened up a whole new set of doorways for you to walk through. Yeah, I think a lot of that is because of who they are and what they've done in the past. I mean, attaching ourselves to an agency that's already doing great work with great clients. Um, but, you know, Stephen Bartlett, if you don't know him, runs Diary of a CEO, which is number one or two podcast maybe globally or definitely in the UK um Oliver runs an incredible uh business as as this as the co-founder and CEO um and I and I firmly believe it takes us out of the brand the band of agencies mm. who just work with kind of SMB e-commerce brands and it opens up to so much more potential um, and I truly believe that the team that we have collectively and our ability to think um, about how to solve problems for brands and companies, um, it just positions us slightly differently to where Mint was. It, it, there's, there's more collective capabilities uh, and abilities to kind of, um, you know, think bigger uh, and put no limits on what our capabilities are. Mm, that's awesome yeah and you know it's so cool that you like your status of what was the high the highest point on the mountain right and you kind of looked up at and now you're you're swinging at the same plate they are yeah yeah it's a, it's a real <laughs> it's a real pinch me moment you know and I, and I don't want to be kind of like fanboyish around them, but I mean, I looked up to these guys um, yeah. when we were acquired and I, I did a presentation to the whole company. Um, it all started with a DM. I DM'd Oliver like a couple of years ago. Uh, that started the relationship that ultimately allowed these conversations to happen for us to be acquired by his company. And, you know, I think like, I don't, necessarily believe in manifestation i but i do believe in well if you put out the right uh if you if you if you put out the right intent and outputs and everything else you know that opens up the potential of future things happening to you mm -hmm. um does that make sense i don't yeah. believe just purely like if i sat here and just like one day Stephen and all are gonna purchase my agency no I made the connect. I connected with him on Instagram. We went for coffee three years ago. We developed that. Do you see what I mean? I developed that relationship. So I think, if, you know, luck and manifestation 
I think is actually more of a byproduct of planting the right seeds along your journey that you can capitalize on at a future date. Yeah, no, I, I totally am a believer in uh, relationships and having a vision for things and letting things sprout uh, naturally, but also planting the seeds in the right areas to see what sprouts. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's agreed. awesome. You talked a lot about the thinking you guys can think about solving problems in ways that you maybe there's more capabilities more of team horsepower to do it what it, what problems now with with the team in front of you are you most excited about solving a lot of the problems are the same as they've always been um and then there's some new ones right so i mean the, for us, we work with e-commerce brands largely. Um, we do work with some other types of businesses, but traditionally we, within Flight Performance Mint, we, we work with e-commerce brands. And, you know, the challenge has always been how do we get more customers and how do we keep them and how do we do that whilst being profitable or efficient? I, I just think like from a from a capability standpoint of the team that we've built and how we structure our strategies and executions, um, I just think we have done a phenomenal job of, of understanding how to do that and educate clients in the right way, right? We, I, we, I fight against being a service business and fight for every day, and everybody in the company fights for this, of being a very outcome-driven team right? It's like, we think a lot about time to value. How can we speed up the, the time at which what we're doing for our clients achieves or elicits value to them or to their business? How do we think about that from a marketing perspective? So, you know, I just think like our philosophy of being incredibly outcome driven with our clients is what allows us to do great work. And, and that constant curiosity, um, both as professionals of how can I become 1% better every day, but also how can we go that 1% better for our clients with each thing that we do? And then more broadly, um, you know, you look at things like AI, right? Um, we just announced Mo Gordat, um, ex-Google X officer, um, author, like real pivotal kind of guy in the AI space and just technology space. Um, to have him on our team as our chief AI officer, you know, really sharpens our understanding internally as well. What's the opportunity? What's the threats? How should we be thinking about it? How should we be using it? How can we educate our clients and companies on how to also do those things? So I think if I was to try and put a bow on it a little bit, Brian, it's like we focus so much on our philosophies to achieving results and then testing very, very quickly. And it's actually something Stephen had on a recent, uh, on his LinkedIn post. And it's so true of, of the, everybody in the company. It's like, be willing to fail often through testing because you're not testing blind. It's on, it's, it's guided by an overarching philosophy to how you approach things. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. He said it better than I did, by the way, but that's kind of. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, the, it seems like a very exper experiment of culture where you're able to learn and grow. And uh, I mean, it seems like a culture that's perfect for you, right? Uh, that's going to elevate you as well and um, give you give you new things to really work through and work on. So yeah, I'm excited for you and, and congratulations on Thank you, man. an incredible journey. Thank you, dude. I appreciate it. As you kind of look back on these, I'm doing math, 19 years uh, since starting, um, you've quit the lessons, you, you, you've changed a lot, and it seems like a lot of good positives from this. And um, how are you, you know, just to say, we're arc bound, we always, I'm always about, like, what's, what's someone's arc, their life, their trajectory, right? What's, what are they trying to achieve? You know, for you, how are you looking at the next decade? Not so much from a business perspective, but life perspective, you know, in terms of what's important to you, kind of how you're spending time and, and what, what you want to be doing, maybe that you haven't achieved or experienced yet. Yeah, that's a, 
It's a deep question. It's a, it's a good question. You know, for me, I'm always going to be someone who is highly driven to achieve things in business. Like, I don't ever foresee a time, at least in the near horizon, where I want to slow down. And and I think like from being from being acquired and being part of Flight Story, for me, it's like, like I said, it's it's day one. The opportunity now is massive. What I think longer term is, you know, you kind of mentioned it. I've I've achieved quite a lot and gone from, you know kind of countryside, you know, high school, not very good, kind of drop out, music college, dropped out of that, worked at a tele agency to then scaling and acquire, having my agency acquired over in, in Los Angeles. I think I've got a lot. I would like to be able to, to help other entrepreneurs who are building, who are doing other things. I've, I've done some angel investments, but more so from like a um, mentorship standpoint, um, I think that's something I'm super interested in. And just more broadly, you know, longer, longer term is I think you get to the point where, or I would want to get to the point where my, I'm a bit more efficient with my time, right? At the moment, it's still very, very, you know, 15, 16 hours a day work. I think I'd love to get to a point where I'm uh, <laughs> maybe working less which I'm able to do in some respects. I have an amazing team, don't get me wrong, but better time balance between and and kind of like ability to be selective on what I work on versus what I don't um, would would be nice. You know, it's been it's been head down work for the last literally ten years um, mm-hmm. since getting to the U.S. to yeah. to kind of get to this point. And I think over time. Uh, you don't want to be financially rich and time poor, right? You want to be time rich and financially okay. <laughs> what's the what's the quote? It's uh, like you work, you work to get like it's, you work to get wealthy, and then you use your wealth to get healthy or something. Yeah, it's yeah. Like the Dalai Lama, some quote about wealth and health, and yeah, uh, the goal is to yeah have health and wealth and time. Um, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Daniel, if you could tell Daniel, the Daniel at, you know, 20 years old, 15 years old, a few things, what what, what are some things that you, you, you wish you would have shared with them then that you know today? You know, a lot of the things that, people often say or answer to that question is like, take more risks, do more things. I did fucking everything and took every risk, like literally. I think the thing that I would say to my 20 year old self is, is to trust the process a bit more. And I think like to enjoy the journey a bit more, you know, I think it's really difficult to separate when you when you're running a company when you launch a company i think it's really difficult to separate business success with personal happiness and i definitely struggled with that for a very long time you know if the business was doing well if we had good months good weeks i was a i was happy if we weren't the that played on me significantly and was very mentally challenging um so I would say to myself to enjoy the journey um, and try as much as possible to detach business success from personal happiness. Yeah, that's powerful. I think a lot of business owners go through that uh, or they uh, learn, learn, learn that lesson one way or another, never learn it at all. So yeah, uh, I think, um, you know, it's funny. It's like, you're talking about your qualities of, you're never going to stop building. It's day one. You've had this success. You're going to go to the next success. But yeah, well, in the middle of all of it, it's like, yeah. How do you how do you slow it down a little bit and smell the roses, as they they say? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel, this has been amazing. Um, I'm thrilled about where we've gone. Is there anything based on the conversation that 
you wish I would have asked or uh, care to share as we close out here? No, Brian, I, I thank you so much for the time. It's, we've been talking for, it feels like five minutes. So I feel like I could talk for ages. Um, no, I, I think, you know, it's rare I do podcasts actually or speak so openly about the journey side of things. So I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to tell more about kind of my journey and and and, and everything else. Um, I don't know, I guess not, not, not necessarily something you haven't covered, but I guess if there's anyone out there who is looking for kind of an ultimate takeaway from all this, it's just to bet on yourself and try. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll never know. There you go. Bet on yourself and try. I dig it. Cool. Well, Daniel, where can people find you, reach out to you uh, if they're inspired? Yeah, best place is LinkedIn. Um, just search me on LinkedIn, Daniel James on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Twitter as well. Weird name, but it's foodog85. Mm -hmm. um, there's a story behind that for another day. Uh, but yeah, those, those are the two best places to find me. LinkedIn uh, being number one. Amazing. Well, Daniel, thanks so much. Uh, really appreciate you and uh, all that you've done and uh, the conversation we had today. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for joining me on The One Away Show. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, please leave a review and follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Have a one away moment you'd like to share? Follow me on Twitter or Instagram at BrianWish underscore or reach out to me on LinkedIn and tell me about the moment that altered your life. The One Away Show is produced by ArcBound, a company dedicated to helping entrepreneurs, experts, and visionaries launch authentic personal brands. From message development to podcast production, social media content generation, and book writing, we work with you to create your arc. Head to arcbound.com to learn more. Thank you for listening, and please join me next time on The One Away Show.